Welcome to Financial Repression Authority's Roundtable Insight, where the best fund managers, economists, and industry leaders discuss the key investment issues and challenges in the current macroeconomic environment. Hi, welcome to FRA's Roundtable Insight. This is Richard Bonulli, CEO of Cedar Goal, with our senior advisor, Alejandro Taliavini. Today, we have a very interesting show on art and architecture as an asset class, and also how this can relate to sustainability, which we focus on a lot in our firm. We're going to explore this in more detail with some very special guests. Here now to introduce our guest is our senior advisor, Alejandro Taliavini. Hi, Richard. How are you? How is everybody? Well, today we have very, very interesting people and very, very nice people indeed. Uh, we have Princess Diana de Orleans, Prince Pablo Su Hohenlohen Langeborg, um, their Richard Earl of Thailand, and Mr. Julian Watson. Oh, uh, each of these people are going to talk about their properties, which are very, very interesting. So let us begin with uh, the only lady we have today, unfortunately, the only lady, uh, with Princess Diana. How are you, Diana? I'm very well. Good evening to all of you. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this very interesting conversation. I'm very happy to be here and to be able to, to discuss and talk a little bit about my family home. The Cadaval Palace has been in my family for over 600 years. It was built by my ancestors in the 14th century. I actually had, let me see if I can actually share my, my screenshots. Let me see if this will work or if not at all, we'll just, can you see anything? Yeah. Yes. Yep. yep. Wonderful. So this is the first time I'm actually managing to share something on Zoom. So bear with me. <laughs> I, hope all of this, I hope all of this will go well. So the Caraval Palace has been in my family for 600 years. It is situated in Evora in Portugal. Evora was nominated Patrimoine de l'Humanité by UNESCO in 1980 because it's a city that is still a, a fortress. It has a fortress all around. And us, the palace was built on the ruins of the Moorish castle. And I will show you a photo here of the outside for you to have a better understanding. So we are built on the top of the ruins of the Moorish castle. We have the two towers that are medieval. And we, you will see as right in front of us, because we are in the heart of the city, of the historical city, we have the Roman temple. So the, this is the entrance to our church and you have the Roman temple. So Evora and in the back on the right hand behind the temple, you can see the cathedral, which is medie medieval. And so our church, I'm very happy to share with you, was nominated the most beautiful private church in the country due to its beauty and collection of tiles. So you can see here a photo of our church. It's her name, she is known or by Igreja dos Loyos or Igreja São João Evangelista. It really depends. She has two different names and two different references, if you see in historical books. And she is she was built by my ancestor in the 14th century. The tiles that you can see, and it, what is unique about her is that she is covered with her tiles from top to bottom. The tiles date from uh, the early 18th century and they represent scenes of the life of the Eloi um, congregation from Venice. Here I'll show you another image where you can have a closer look of all of our panels of our church. And so what we've done is with all these families where, you know, and I'm sorry, I forgot to mention in the beginning, I'm the 11th Duchess de Carava, so I'm the 11th generation and before that my ancestor who built it was the count of olivenza which is now spanish um don't what we've been doing over the centuries is no like all families we've had our very grand moments and our less grand moments and so we my father the 10th duke de Carava, who unfortunately passed away in 2001 began the renovation of the church and palace which needed tremendous work so we did we restore the palace itself the church which had suffered with the earthquake 
And so we realized after, after all this hard work that we had put into it, we decided if we were to keep it closed, what would we really do? Because we don't live full time in the Carval Palace. So we took the decision of opening a part of it to the public, which we have for the past 15 years. So we've opened the church and the palace itself. And then we thought that, you know, for our visitors, for all of this to be a richer and a more exciting experience, we needed to have, you know, different, exhibitions annually and so one of the exhibitions we did in the church was with, with a very good friend of ours my mother's closest of friend Hubert de Givenchy and so what we did was an haute couture wedding gowns and we were very fortunate to have dresses lent by the Balenciaga Foundation, La Maison Dior, Yves Saint Laurent, Givenchy, my wedding dress which was that made by Caroline Herrera we also had um, we also had Philippe Bonnet, which was a very well known designer. So this is one of the last exhibitions we have done in the palace. Here you'll see the exterior. This is one of the gardens. And we always been like for the past 10 years, we've been very focused in contemporary art. So we of course have all the historic part that goes with the place and the family but as well, we're investing a lot on contemporary. So the painting you can see there that we had, we ordered and was painted by the famous South African artist, Esther Malagou. I don't know if you're very familiar with contemporary African art. The Vuitton Foundation had done a beautiful exhibition in Paris. And so we took their curator, André Magnin, which is French and he's number one in the world. And he brought us Esther. And the painting you see is the biggest painting she's done in her life and this lady just to give you an idea is 82 years old does not know how to read and write and paints with chicken feathers this painting was made with chicken feathers and there is not a single ruler involved and the geometry of her vision is just perfection itself and she still dresses in traditional in her traditional outfits, which include the patterns you see in the painting and the colors, all her village is painted the same way. And so we've worked very closely with her and many, many other artists that we had. This was an exhibition that we did last year and we had about 30 different artists from Africa. For the summer, we were meant to, for the summer, we were meant to have a beautiful exhibition that we've been working on for the past year, my team and I, with the Yves Saint Laurent Foundation. Unfortunately, as you can imagine with COVID, all of that was postponed for 2022. So we will have an exhibition dedicated to Morocco fashion and to always, we always mix music, art and fashion in the whole lot. And I forgot to mention, of course, that my mother initiated a music festival 20 years ago, which was purely yeah. classical which was purely classical. And now we've opened ourselves to world music. So we have artists coming from Asia, India, South America, and it's been a tremendous success. Our visitors have enjoyed that tremendously. We've grown year after year. And of course, let me remind you that all of this is done to preserve the grounds. All we are an, a non-lucrative association. So all money made is reinvested entirely in the renovation of the palace itself. All the church. Here I'll show you some images of the inside. This is one of the dining rooms because we we'll, which you can visit in the upstairs part. <clears throat> some Portuguese paintings. Here is from the other view the the same dining room as you can see. Here we you can see a little bit of you no know, the mix of what we do with our ancestors and with the contemporary because we've started mixing more and more. Here we have the nativity, you know, a painting from the 16th century. And we've put two photos on each side from a photographer from Mozambique. His name is Mauro Pinto. And so we have been mixing and here you can see a part of it. And I forgot to going back to its architecture because I think that now we can't just talk about contemporary art and you know, our, what we've been doing today, but we've been very active for the past 15 years. I must say that this has been a tremendous family effort. We all work together and we've really made 
miracles happen because culture in Portugal isn't easy, but we've done it with a lot of dedication and love and we've been able to pull it through and we've had fantastic sponsors with us for so many years. And the Tower of the Five Shields, which here at the beginning when I showed you the exterior of the house, which is the tower on the left-hand side, when we say five shields it's because it's got five corners, it's, I think, in terms of architecture, no, Professor, if you don't, if I'm not mistaken, is really, it's one of, I think it's the only one in Europe that there is in terms of architecture. It's got five corners instead of four. And so this tower was where we had Don Fernando, who was accused of treason against the king. And so he was imprisoned into this tower. And his trial happened on the main floor of the palace. And unfortunately enough, he was found guilty and was taken from our palace to the Praça do Giraldo, which is the main uh, plaza where he was decapitated. We are here. So this was a very sad happening. And then of course, we've had some very positive ones. My father, for instance, Snow was the first Duke to come back. He was the 10th generation because I forgot to mention that the Cadaval family, we left in exile for 120 years with the King, Dom Miguel. And so we were absent. And when my father began with the renovations, we were all the different generations of dukes were scattered around the world and buried in different locations and so in the 70s early 60s 70s when he started the renovations he brought by boat 30 coffins to be able to reunite the family once and for all and to bury everyone in the church so now i can gladly say that this is le musolet de la famille Cadavala, and this is where all of the dukes and duchesses are buried we are direct we are no we are directly linked to the portuguese royal family because we descend from the braganzas we've had three alliances with the portuguese with the portuguese royal family and over the centuries we the cadaval were no we were very close to the to the king and to the decisions to be taken. We are direct descendants of the Santo Condestave, which is the famous knight who defended Portugal three times when the Spaniards tried to invade us. He was sanctified by the Vatican a few years ago. And so we, you know what, we try to keep our history going and to tell our story and to be able to share with those who, who are interested and who want to hear a bit of you know, the history and past and the history of Portugal. Well, this is, our, this is our role. This is what we do with a lot of passion and with um, a lot of challenges to overcome, which we always did. And we're very happy and proud to, to be here today. Well, thank you so much. Amazing presentation. It's beautiful. <laughs> thank you, Alejandro. Thank you very much. Oh, no, thank you. It was very, very nice. Amazing, really. A very, very nice place, Evora, in Portugal. A very nice, touristic place. Okay, yeah, now we'll go to... Thank you. We'll go to Spain to listen to <laughs> Prince Pablo. Pablo? Pablo, can you listen to me? Paulo? We lost Paulo. <laughs> no, we lost Paulo. Yeah. Huh? Maybe, we may have lost him temporarily, but he looks like he's trying to join. Okay. Well, let's go to Richard. Richard, can you listen to me? Hello, you yes, yes. <laughs> okay, let's go. Richard. Hi, evening, everyone. Um, thank you very much for this uh, opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, my family home, Curramore House in County Waterford, Ireland. Um, I've brought uh, Julian Waltz and very kindly has joined us, who is more knowledgeable about Curramore and more knowledgeable about history in the Waterford area than, than, than anyone I know. So uh, thank you, Julian, for, for jo joining us. Um, I'm just going to try and share. I'm just going to try and share something. Um, hang on a second. Yep. Okay. 
Okay. So. Yep. Right. Can everyone see that? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So Curramore uh, is the ancestral home of uh, the Marks of Wardford. My father is the current ninth Marks of Wardford, and himself and my mother, the Marchioness of Wardford, they reside here at Curramore. Um, as you can see, uh, there's a substantial uh, estate with uh, a very large courtyard and, and gardens. Um, but just to go back to the beginning so you understand the history of my family. So my name is Richard, the Earl of Tyrone. I'm the son of, of the Marks of Wolford. Um, my family have, have lived resided at Curramore in this very spot since about the uh, the early 12th century. We have no evidence of, of uh, showing us exactly when we landed in Ireland, but we believe it's either the end of the 11th or beginning of the 12th century. And we've resided here that whole time. So for over 800 years, my family um, can trace our lineage uh, and our history uh, right back to then. So we we're originally a Norman family um, and we were granted lands by King John in the southeast of Ireland. Uh, we then sailed the sea with, with Strongbow and landed in Ireland then. Um, the, there was a keep erected in Curramore. You can kind of see, if you see the front of the house there, um, obviously it's been built on and, and encased in, in different types of architecture since then, but the one side of the keep, of the original, original wall, uh, is actually still there and you can see it uh, within the house. When you go into the basement, you can see uh, the sloping wall of the side of the keep um, that was built in the 15th century, because as I'm sure you're aware, in those days, the walls were sloped, so when you're throwing things down on your enemies, they'd bounce out and hit them. Um, the keep has its original features still there. There's a secret room uh, and a spiral staircase. Um, this is the front of the house. Uh, as you can see, that was kind of the, the original design was, was the keep in the front, and then the, the back side was, was built on uh, in about uh, the mid 17th century. So uh, the, some of the bigger works, uh, architectural works at Curramore were made uh, by the third Marks of Wardford, Henry. Um, he employed uh, James Wyatt, a famous English architect who supposedly never actually visited Curramore, but it is one of his uh, most uh, uh, profound uh, works uh, in terms of the architecture and technology that was used at that time. So if, if we just go back a slide, um, you can see the courtyard there. It's the largest courtyard in Ireland. So it was built over 200 years ago. The original drainage is still there. Um, really, this was technology before its time. It was so efficient. Uh, it still works today perfectly uh, it's one of the wettest parts of the estate where they actually built the house and and the courtyard but it um as i mentioned it, it, it drains uh superbly um this is probably the oldest relic we have at Carabor. um it's a crystal ball and i don't know too much about it so i've, I've written uh, a few notes here um but I think that the myth is at those times, the myth was that crystal balls were, were brought, brought back from the Crusades. So to, to own one, to have one in your possession was, was something quite special. Um, within Irish folklore especially, uh, they're supposed to have healing powers. And uh, the Caramore crystal ball was supposedly... Um, said it could cure moraine and cattle so they used to put uh, the water the, the crystal ball in running water or in or within the water source that, that the cattle used to drink out of and it supposedly cured the moraine which is a disease of that time um which is quite interesting but as i said it's the oldest 
relic we have and it dates back to the 15th century wow. uh, julian would you like to take over from, from here right yep certainly can you hear me all right yes yeah. well. okay I'm sorry yeah. about that. I'm I'm back. I'm 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 on I'm back here. I don't know what happened. Okay. The connection is not very stable where I am. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, uh, yep. Yeah, right. Caramore has been, as Richard said, uh, the home and seat of the same family for many centuries. The family was originally called Le Poor or Power, and it's changed only once in surname. Uh, when the heiress to Curramore, Catherine Power, who succeeded when she was a small girl, married Sir Marcus Beresford uh, from the other end of the county, country at <coughs> Coleraine in Ulster uh, in 1717, an easy date to remember. And this is a huge portrait uh, in the entrance hall, at the keep at, at Curramore. Uh, a family historian has said that they seem to be determined to have not only the, the largest courtyard in Ireland, but the largest family portrait as well. It's painted in a, about 1760 by the English painter John Astley, and it shows uh, Sir Marcus Beresford, uh, now Earl of Tyrone, his wife, Lady Catherine, who had inherited Curramore, and their surviving children were now adults. And what is remarkable about this portrait to me is that by the end of the 18th century everyone you see in this portrait either had been a, a member of the Irish Parliament or was married to one they the, the, the three boys had very successful careers um, you see uh, Marcus and Catherine who are seated uh, to their left is their, their youngest and perhaps favorite daughter by the look of her um, uh, Lady Betty and then on her left, in red, uh, is the eldest son, George, who succeeded his father and became the first Marquis of Waterford. So he owned enormous estates, and he sat in the Irish House of Lords. And on his left is his brother, John, who became first Commissioner of the Revenue in Ireland. Very useful thing to be in those days, and probably today as well, I don't know. And um, he was one of the three most important political figures in Ireland. Um, he was responsible for, among other things, uh, bringing over the architect G uh, George uh, Gandon to Ireland, um, who did a great deal of work in Dublin and put up some of our most beautiful buildings in our capital city. And right to the left of the portrait, you see the youngest boy, William, and he goes into the church and he becomes an archbishop. So between the three boys, they're, they're they have very illustrious careers. And then the girls, as I said, all married very well. So that, that is really a sort of vignette of what the Curramore family was like uh, in the late 18th century, the height of the Georgian period in Ireland. Perhaps we could go on to the next slide, Richard. Um, and across on the entrance hall from that huge portrait is this one, which uh, to me, encapsulates the, the family as it was 100 years later, in the middle of the 19th century. These are four sons of the fourth Marquis, and the, the, the three smallest uh, are too young to have been put into trousers, so they're still wearing skirts. But they are all boys, and they look very happy there, playing with their toys. The eldest boy who's standing, he becomes the fifth Marquis, and he becomes a captain in the uh, Royal Dragoon Guards, the British Army, had various successes um, as in, in horse racing. There's a huge trophy in the inner hall, which he had won. The next boy, the, the boy who's, who's kneeling on one knee, um, he became an admiral in the Royal Navy, a favorite of uh, King Edward VII until they had a quarrel over a mistress. And he was one of the key people in the imperial period of late Victorian England. He became a hero uh, in the uh, Egyptian campaign of 1882, when he disobeyed orders and sailed close into the uh, forts at Alexandria and silenced one of the forts with his guns. That's Lord Charles Beresford. And the boy on his right, who's playing with bricks, um, 
That's William. William joined the army, a very successful career in the army, and he fought in the war against the Zulus in Africa and earned the Victoria Cross by rescuing uh, a, a wounded soldier who was under attack in a battle. And the smallest of the boys on the left, Marcus, he managed the king's racing stables. So the, the four of those, while you see them there as small children, looking very meek and mild, they all had very distinguished careers. There was actually a fifth boy who was born much later, uh, Lord Delaval Beresford, and he's the one who got away. He went over to America and he bought um, a cattle ranch in Mexico, which he ran very successfully. He bought another one in, in Canada, in Saskatchewan. And one day uh, on a train journey between the two ranches, there was a train crash and he was killed, very sadly. But those five boys really, they, they, they show what a, a varied and vibrant life uh, the Caramor family had. This is a miniature of the, the third Marquess of Waterford. Um, so early 19th century, uh, he had a reputation for being a real tear away. Uh, he was renowned for his practical jokes. Uh, he was also a very keen huntsman. Uh, he was master of the Tipperary Hounds and later of the Waterford Hounds. And he was so, could, sorry, Richard, could we go back to that previous image? That, that's it, yeah. Uh, in 1839, he took part in the Edmonton tournament in Scotland, which was um, a reenactment of a, med a medieval tournament, uh, a very costly affair. And uh, they all wore armor, they had fancy titles, and they jousted with each other. This is him in his Eglinton armor. And here, uh, the, the, the Marquis, so famous for his, his pranks, uh, was conquered, not in the jousting, but by the sight of a fair maiden. Could we go forward again and again? This lady, Louisa Stewart, uh, very beautiful, rather shy, and he was captivated by her, pr proposed marriage to her. They got married. She came to Coromore. And uh, she's one of the most remarkable people in the history of Caramore. She reformed him. He became very respectable. There he is. Uh, yeah, we can go on to him, Richard, if you like. Uh, this is a, 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 a portrait of her husband in later life uh, by Louisa, working at his desk. And she herself uh, was a very gifted painter. Uh, she also was involved in various philanthropic works on the estate. Uh, she built a cotton factory um, on one of the little towns, a part of the estate. Uh, they both um, uh, operated relief works during the, the great potato famine of the 1840s. And then when he was killed in a hunting accident, she retired to the estate that they owned in Northumberland, right up near the border with, with Scotland. And there she, she lived for the rest of her life. She became very famous as an artist. And at Curramore, there are about 40 of her paintings. Um, I've showed you this one because it's one of my favorites. It's called The Little Queen. And it shows uh, a painting of three children, probably from Ford in Northumberland rather than from Curramore. And they're in fancy dress. And the Little Queen is looking very superior and walking along with her train which is held by two other little boys. Uh, very politically incorrect, I'm afraid, because she's white and the two little boys have got their faces blacked out. But there you are, that was the way of the times. She traveled a great deal. Uh, she wrote home uh, to her husband. And this is part of one of the letters in which uh, she, she's, she has a little sketch of this um, peasant whom she, she, she met while out on one of her walks. This was uh, written from what was then Mentone, now Monton. It was then uh, part of the kingdom of Savoy, uh, later became part of France. And she says to him, you must come to my hotel so that I can draw you. And he turns up and uh, she does a drawing of him, which turned, which she then redid as a painting, which is now in the, in the royal collections at Windsor Castle. So that's Louisa, who's 
very important in, in, uh, in the Karamora story. This is a sketch that she did showing um, the Waterford hounds. It's, uh, they've, they've chased a, a fox, which has fallen over a cliff, and the hounds have fallen over, and they're going down on ropes to try and, and, and rescue the, the, the hounds. So that's another of, of her works. Uh, on the estate, up on a hill, is the family chapel, Clonagam Church, which has some wonderful monuments of the family. And this is really the most famous. It depicts the first wife of the fifth Marquis, Florence Grosvenor. She, he, he married her, it was a real marriage of love. He married her against everybody's wishes. Uh, she had been previously married, there was a divorce, there was an elopement, it was awful. And eventually he, they got married, he brought her back to Curramore, and she died in childbirth. And she, he uh, employed the uh, Sir Joseph Boehm, one of the royal sculptors, to do this beautiful monument of her, which is in the church on the Curramore estate. We can go on now. What's next, Richard? Um, in the, the, the gardens, just close to the house, is this wonderful shell house. The shell houses were um, a, a great fashion in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, they were modeled on ancient Roman shell houses, also very popular in the Renaissance. And um, they're supposed to resemble a marine grotto. So you go in, this rather unpretentious looking building, and inside uh, you, 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 you think you're in a sort of underground cave. It was created by Catherine, uh, the, the, the girl who had inherited Caramore in 1754. And this is her statue by John Van Nost in the middle of the shell house. Um, and there's a little uh, in, plaque, a little uh, uh, scroll that she's holding, which tells us that she erected uh, the, the, the shells, put them up with her very own hands in 261 days in the year 1754. Now the shell house must have taken a long time to build. The shells took a long time to collect. And she doesn't say they were consecutive days, but um, that's the shell house, which is one of the main attractions of Coromore. Julian, thank you very, very much. Uh, much appreciated. Um, Thanks. And uh, just to uh, kind of uh, finish things off, I'd just like to, well, th Julian, thank you very much. Um, thank you. But I'd like to please put, uh, welcome all of you. If you're ever in Ireland, please don't hesitate to get in touch and visit Curramore. There are, you know, many, many interesting things. I think we've, we haven't had much time, so we've only really skimmed the surface. Um, and do please keep an eye out for Louisa Wardford and, and her works. Um, she is probably one of my favorite ancestors. And fortunately, she's not a blood relative. We didn't manage to inherit her, uh, her talents in the family um, because she was unable to have children. However, she is, she's phenomenal and uh, she's, she's a very well-known known artist. Um, but yeah, thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Richard and Julian, very much. It was a great presentation, beautiful, great, very nice. <laughs> now let's go to Spain. Prince Pablo, how are you? I'm very well indeed. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you. And I'm uh, very excited to 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 um to be to be here in this show. Um, uh, be, before I start uh, showing the family um, houses, I would like to. Make a, a, a little introduction on 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 the history of Spain, and that will uh, make you understand why uh, only a handful of families got to the 20th century with a relevant historical heritage. Being a country with uh, thousands of castles and, and hundreds of of historic uh, of, of of noble families, um, so uh, let me let me let me go through the last 600 years. It may be two minutes. Uh, um, so during the Middle Ages, when a noble died, you know, the eldest son or firstborn uh, inherited all the lands and fortunes of his father. Um, 
behind this, there was probably a military purpose. Uh, since nobles provided funding, uh, supplies, and uh, military, military service to the king uh, during the Spanish reconquest, uh, they needed vast and stable territories to supply and organize the troops, the combat elements. Now, the primogeniture was not necessarily by way of, of man like it is in other countries. Uh, Spain uh, had been in a state of war for many centuries, and that made male mortality extremely high. Um, so to prevent the family lines from becoming extinct, um, it was agreed that in the event of a lack of a male succession, it should pass through the female route. So as uh, since no noble families married among uh, uh, married each other, and due to that enormous male mortality, on many occasions the wife, the wife of a duke, ended up inheriting inheriting the title and properties from her dead brother, another duke. So this situation uh, caused the the son to inherit the titles and lands from both families, from the mother and from the father. Um, this was repeated con um, over and over. And as a result of this, the number of noble families was being reduced uh, dramatically as opposed to what was happening in Europe where nobility was in full expansion. Now, the, re the, the result allowed already powerful families gather huge fortunes uh, and vast territories throughout the all regions of Spain. And um, if, if I may, I'd like to show uh, an image. Let me see now if I know how to do this. May I? May I? Yeah, compartir pantalla. We go to Vista Previa. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so all these titles, um, uh, are, are the titles that gathered into one family. So one same family had all these titles around Spain. Um, precisely, it was my family, but it happened in other families as well. This was an extreme, but it, it happened in other families that they gathered 30 or 40 titles. So um, uh, this situation totally changed in the 19th century after the, the birthrights uh, for, the, for the primogeniture were abolished following the Napoleonic Wars, uh, following the Napoleonic Code after the wars. Um, and the already weakened families and castles that were in bad condition or even destroyed after these wars had to be abandoned or sold as they had to be divided among their heirs. So uh, these divisions that occurred in, in each generational change pushed my grandmother to save what came to her, which was just a, a small fraction of what her father inherited from his father. And for this reason, she established the foundation with the aim of conserving, restoring, reintegrating um, uh, the heritage link to the house of Meita Theri through, through, through time. So um, the, uh, let me go to the next picture, which is, let me see, hold on a second. Okay, um, the way the foundation works, it's very similar to how um, the British National Trust manages its properties. Uh, that is, those monuments that are in good condition and therefore uh, um, uh, have uh, visitors uh, and therefore income um, not only are able to finance themselves but also contribute to the maintenance of those monuments that due to the uh, uh, geographical location a bit out of the way or the states of conservation do not obtain visits and therefore funds to maintain themselves. Uh, these are the actually right now the four monuments that are open to the public and uh, soon there will be a fifth one, and the ones we're going to talk about. These are the others, and some are not restored and probably won't even be restored. They will remain uh, nice ruins. Uh, some are halfway, and others are in pretty good condition, and soon they will be they will have a use. Um, shall we start with? Okay, this is Palace of Tavera. 
it's a 16th century palace. Actually, uh, it was the most important building of the Toledan classical uh, Renaissance style and one of the most splendid constructions of the period. Uh, initially, it was built as a general hospital during um, the most lively and cosmopolitan period of the of the city of Toledo. Um, the architectural highlight, I've got to cut it short because we have a lot of things to talk about. Um, the architectural highlight of the building are the twin patios, which you can see there, um, said to be at the time, one of the most solemn, sober and complex cloisters of modern uh, architecture. Uh, that central gallery, uh, which divides the patio, creates a magnificent sense of space. Um, and the idea of the architect uh, was to direct the eye towards the church and viewed from other angles, one may appreciate the amazing symmetry and proportions of, of the arches and columns. Now heading into the church, we come across the, the sepulcher, which we see here on the, on the bottom left, uh, the sepulcher of the Cardinal Tavera. Uh, it, was, it was made, it was the last work done by Berrugetti. Berrugetti was the, the Spanish uh, Michelangelo. Um, uh, so he, he died just after having completed this work. He died in the clock, in the clock tower uh, on the picture on the right, on the upper right, that room over there he died. Um, the, then we, we see the altarpiece that was designed by El Greco, together with the paintings that, that were there, or some are still there, uh, and together he had previously been commissioned to paint a number of pieces, uh, as well as to design a, a tabernacle, which we, which we see on top, uh, to, uh, um, to, to, to house his uh, resuscitated Christ the only sculpture El Greco ever did. We see the little pictures there. Um, these pieces can now be seen in our museum, along with a few other magnificent paintings by, by El Greco himself and, and uh, a number of paintings from the 16th and 17th century, from uh, Luca Giordano, Zurbaran, Pantoja, Rivera, etc. Um, the building, let me go down to the, okay. What we see on top is a pharmacy. Uh, this building also houses the oldest pharmacy in Europe. Um, the pharmacy is the only room in the hospital complex that continues to have its original identity in the same place as the architect Covarrubias originally intended. Uh, inside, we find a large collection of items from the 16th and 17th centuries, sort of, such as uh, ceramic and glazed earthenware, jars, mortars, spatulas, and particularly this wardrobe, this um, uh, 16, 17th century polychrome cupboard uh, whose doors uh, open uh, seven, 16 other, other small drawers in which the most expensive medicines and gems were kept, such as garnets or emeralds. Now, on the right, we see uh, is that we see what we see is a crypt. Uh, it's a circular space with a vaulted or domed, I think it's called dome, no, domed uh, roof that serves as a family pantheon uh, for the Mainatheli uh, family since the end of the 19th century. My, my ancestors, uh, grandmother, mother, uncles are buried there. Uh, so this building also houses the old hospital archives. That little picture on the left and the center, and the archives of the uh, of the ducal house of Mainatheli. Um, this last one contains an impressive collection of documents which go back over a thousand years. And um, okay, that was Tavera. Okay, I could go on for hours, but I mean, <laughs> I'm going to make it short. Uh, Pilatos is probably. The one most known is certainly the one most visited because it's in the center of Sevilla and Sevilla is a very touristic city and everybody who, go, who goes to Sevilla most probably goes and sees, visits the house. It's one of the most visited monuments in, in, in the city. Uh, it's a palace known as Casa Pilatos and was built uh, between the 15th and 16th centuries and, uh, and is located in the historical part of Seville's city center. Um, the unusual stylistic diversity of this palace brings together 
complementary Gothic, Renaissance, uh, Romantic, and, and also Islamic elements. Um, this house, like many of the civilian domestic homes, has two floors with uh, identical floor distribution. The upper one is it was it was used in winter, and the lower floor the, the lower one was was used in summer. But this one in particular, since since the owners of this house were the some 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 kind of the representatives of the king in Andalusia and the region, um, this house was not only uh, his private residence, but it was a public place. Uh, frequented often by hundreds of people. Therefore, public visits were limited to the lower, lower floor, uh, while the upper floor was strictly private. Um, let me go and show you this. Uh, uh, this. Okay, to, to, to change floors, we go through this staircase in the picture on the top and on the right, which is very interesting because for the first time, this, uh, for the first time a staircase became a monumental element in the city's architecture, dividing the more public space of the patio and the reception rooms where we can find a recreation of the interiors of the 16th century palace with pieces from the uh, Medina Theli art collection, um, with period furniture, tapestries, and paintings by Luca Giordano, Giuseppe Recco, Carreño, Miranda, Van Vitelli, and, and more modern paintings by Goya. Um, a, uh, a magnificent collection of sculptures um, was introduced on the 16th century by the Duke of Alcala during his, year, his, his, his time, his years as Viceroy of Naples and Sicily. Um, the Duke of Alcala uh, was mentioned together with great collectors such as Cosimo de' Medici and Cardinal Farnese uh, as, as a, one of the top collectors of the time. And after after his arrival, as his arrival from Naples back back home, uh, the Duke constructed a, a new palace to exhibit the the collection that he had assembled in, in Naples. This new palace was built around the the vegetable garden, the the orchard, which he transformed into a into into an archaeological garden, following the model of a late Roman style palace. Um, those those Roman palaces had, was, were characterized by superimposed lodges that looked towards the open landscape. Instead, he inverted it and opened the balconies towards, towards the, the closed garden. Let me show you another photograph. Okay, but you see the bottom photo is that, uh, is that palace, and here you have more pictures of it. And the garden, in, 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 as you can see in spring, is magnificent. And you can tell it's, it's really Italian. I mean, except for uh, what was made in the 15th century, the 16th century is totally, totally Italian. Okay, this is, um, Oka is, well, I wouldn't say small, but compared to the others, it's certainly small. It's a small palace uh, located in Galicia. Galicia is uh, in the northwest of Spain. Um, originally built as a fortress, and transformed into a livable home at the beginning of the 18th century. Um, of the old fortress remains just uh, the front facade and the tower. All the rest, including the churches, is pure Baroque. Uh, Baroque style, which we can find all over Galicia. And uh, maybe if any of you have been to Santiago de Compostela, it's the same, same style. But Oca is famous for its gardens. Um, uh, the um, the original layout of the gardens date back to the 16th century, but most of it was transformed and expanded during the 18th and 19th century. It is uh, one of the best examples of gardening in Galicia, in which we find, oh, there we go, yeah, in which we find uh, an inseparable unity of water, stone, and vegetation that makes the this monument a masterpiece of architecture engineering and garden design. I mentioned engineering um, because um, it's, it is really interesting to see how part of the water from a river near the garden is um, is diverted towards the the upper zone of the garden and very cleverly very cleverly distributed and controlled through small dams and a number of channels and fountains that provide water to every corner of the garden 
as well as to a, a water mill and, and, and a turbine that supply flour and electricity to the house. Uh, so while the, while the remaining water is channeled back to the, to the river. So it's um, a very sustainable house. I'm sure you would like that. Um, <laughs> between the house and the orchard, we, we come across a bridge that divides two ponds. Uh, this bridge is called the Bridge of the Virtues and the Vanities, or the, or the Good and the Evil. Um, I, I can't really remember one of those. So each of the ponds have an artificial stone boat. Um, the upper one being a, fish, a fishing boat with a fisherman and orange trees. Uh, you see it here, the pictures on the top. Uh, and um, uh, orange trees, and there's white swans, and all very positive. Whereas the one on the bottom, the one on the lower uh, pond is, uh, is a warship with a heraldic monster in the stern of the boat with cannons and acid lemon trees. Each boat represents the good and the evil. And, in, and, and that small picture on the top, which is a, it's a bird view from the pond, um, you see that on top of it is the church. You, can, you can't see it, but on top of it is the church. So it's, it's a bit of a metaphor. Um, uh, so we, when you cross the bridge, you look at the left, you see the, the, the church as if God was overlooking down at us, checking the decisions we take when crossing the bridge. So we cross the bridge and we go to the real garden. Um, Orca still retains the double character of an ornamental garden and a productive orchard uh, with which it was born to serve the 18th century ideal of perfect harmony between utility and beauty. Um, this is why in its conservation, uh, special emphasis is placed on taking care that specimens of great botanical value, uh, such as a collection of camellias, a historic collection of camellias, live together next to other plantations, such as kiwis or vineyards, apple trees, or, um, here we go. And uh, alignments of um, geometric alignments made with box around the vegetable garden. So this is oh, this, uh, this picture in the top shows the, the labyrinth. That's interesting because it's, it's inspired by the one at the Canterbury Cathedral. And then next to it is a greenhouse, which is considered to be the oldest greenhouse still in use in Spain. This is a place that you ever go to North of Spain, you must visit because it's a lovely garden. It's a lovely house. So I really invite you to go wherever you want. It's really beautiful. Um, okay. This, it looks like a church, but it's not really a church. I mean, it is a church, but it, it wasn't made as a church. Um, it was designed in, also in the 16th century. All houses were from the 16th, 15th and 16th century. Um, and... Uh, it was, it was designed as a funerary temple for the Universal Secretary of the Emperor, Charles V, named Francisco Los Cobos, um, and is the, the centerpiece of the Declaration of Ubeda as a World Heritage Site by UNESCO in 2002, 3, 4, I can't remember when. Um, the, the result is a church that is at the height of the best Italian Renaissance architecture uh, that participates in the humanist ambition to, to fuse, to put together the, the classical heritage with that of the Christian world, uh, and an ambition that is also present in its rich iconographic program that we find throughout the whole building, and especially in the facade and in, in its extraordinary sacristy. Let me go. This is inside. Um, this is these are this is an iconography program, and um, here we find mythological allusions in accordance with the Erasmian tendencies of the circle of the emperor Charles V. Um, we find the two tenants support the codes in the center. The two tenants support the codes of arms of of Francisco Los Cobos, the, the secretary of the emperor, on the left and on the right, uh, Maria Mendoza, his wife, resting on sarcophagi that indicate the funerary character of the monument. 
Um, then below is the sacristy. Uh, there's also the ceiling of the sacristy is right here on the, on the bottom right. And the door of the sacristy is, is a very funny door. It's, it's in the in the corner. It's, it's very extremely strange to find a door that goes right in the corner. This this uh, sacristy is 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 something. So the the uniqueness of this sacristy lies in its monumental statuary that fulfills a double function as a supporting element of its architecture and a, as a as a support for a complex iconographic program. Um, Ubeda is, it's funny when, when in Spanish you want to say that something is in the middle of nowhere, you always say it's in the hills of Ubeda. <laughs> so, um, because of this, maybe if I have time, I don't know, how are we doing with time? Do we have? Uh, well, a few minutes, but try to. No, because it's, a, it's another story, but it's, it's about a, it's about a, um, a Michelangelo that was lost for, for 400 years. And it wasn't the church <laughs> because of Ubeda being in the middle of nowhere. No one thought that this Michelangelo was in this church and it was destroyed during the, during the Spanish civil war. And my great grandfather took the, the pieces, uh, stuck them in a wooden case and just left them there with the hope that someone in the future would, would uh, be able to restore it. And my uncle, the Duke of Segorbe took that box to the Lupificio de Piedra Dura in, in Florence and and just left it there. So to make this story short, um, they realized it was the lost Michelangelo. And uh, so what we see on the right, obviously not all the pieces are there, only like 30 or 40% of the original are there. Uh, so they, they made this model with um, nylon and the existing pieces with the hope that in the future, um, the other original pieces will will uh, will appear. and, and uh, you know, complete the, the statue. So it's an interesting story. I'm sorry I didn't have much more time. I uh, could uh, go on, but um, I understand there's no more time now. Well, great, great presentation. Thank you. Hello? Richard Bonulli? Yes. Okay, Any, we're running out of time. Anyone wants to add anything else? Richard Bonulli? Sure, I, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to thank everybody uh, for this great and wonderful and very interesting presentation on the art and architecture collections. It's been fa fascinating. And um, it also is very uh, interesting from the our perspective. We, we look after um, like the UN Sustainable Development Goals. L lots happening here. We've seen a lot of examples on sustainability, inclusivity, the engineering part of it, the environment part of it, uh, all aspects of those goals. So that's Fantastic, uh, and I just want to thank you individually. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Princess Diana, Prince Pablo, uh, Mr. Julian Walton, and Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. Very. Thank you. It was so I, 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 I invite you all to come over and visit anytime. Please. Just let me know. Through yeah, Alejandro. Thank you all so right? much. Yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Hi, Diane. Bye, bye. Yeah. Thank you so much, Fine everybody. Enough. Thank you bye. for inviting Thank you. me. Thank you. You're most welcome. If you ever do come to Portugal, please do come and visit us. We'd be delighted to have you. Thank you so much yeah. for today. Yeah, not Thank in, you. Not in, yeah, not in summer. Edward is so hot in summer. <laughs> <laughs> it's best in the spring. <laughs> or autumn, yeah. or in the autumn. No, it's it, it beautiful. I had dinner, and uh, I had dinner on a, a summer night. I had dinner at at the patio of your palace, and it was beautiful. Oh, and great food. I'm happy to hear that. Oh, well, you must come back, Alejandro. Yeah, I will. <laughs> Thank you. Because we're actually we're renovating. Now that we're talking about renovation, we're redoing all of our gardens by Louis Benesch, the French no, uh, uh, paysagist, huh? and we're redoing the, the restaurant by Jacques Ange. So we're very excited. Oh, great, that will be concluded great. in two months. We'll be done with that. Okay. Great.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank yeah, say, say, say hello to so Charles Philippe. I will, yeah. I will, I will, Pablo. Thank you yeah, so much. Sure, Philippe, please. Yes, I will. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. 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 Thank The investments, investment strategies, and investment philosophies discussed or presented on the show each involve their own unique risk factors, which are not discussed on the show. Any discussions among the panel participants or responses to listener inquiries are based on the personal opinions of the panel participants and do not take into consideration the listener's suitability, objectives, or risk tolerance. Please be advised that you invest or speculate at your own risk.